Alpha has more than I have. All right, we're doing she's, it. Hold she's on. Quite level-headed. She's she wants to achieve for herself before she gives for others. So that's we're simple. now live. <laughs> hey. oh, okay. we'll, we'll go straight into business. So what was what was the focus of the conversation today then? What is we, it? I'm, I'm gonna tell you right. So it is it's Friday. It is what day is it even? It's the 18th of December. I've got the right yeah, day. It is. So we are very very close to everyone hopefully shutting down and having a sleep and taking their rest and doing all of that. The, today I'm trying to stop work from today really, um, and. Yeah, I'd love to share today, like reflections on the year. That might that might seem like an impossible task as well, because it's been a massive year. But the the place I wanted to start our conversation today was with George Floyd. And I am um, I'm looking at an article from the tenth of December, and it's it's called it's from Rolling Out. And they did the Time Time magazine did Person of the Year Final Four. And this is this is what Person of the Year Final Four was. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and frontline healthcare workers. And then there's a picture of George Floyd without his name. And it says racial justice movement. So then it goes on to say, since 1927, Times editors have chosen a person they believe greatly impacted the country and world during the calendar year. And in the case of 2020, the four finalists include the incumbent POTUS, President-elect Joe Biden, Dr. Anthony Fauci and frontline healthcare workers and the movement for racial justice. If you're confused as to what the movement for racial justice is, you're not alone. However, this is how Time Magazine breaks it down on its website. The tragic killing of George Floyd started a movement, not just in America, but across the globe. In the midst of a worldwide pandemic, protesters took to the streets, demanding action to fight racial injustice at the hands of police and any entity that embodies systematic discrimination. There have been some positive outcomes since the movement started, but it's far from over. And it goes on to say, to the editor's credit, they did mention George Floyd, but why not choose him as a finalist, especially since his unfortunate and irresponsible passing started the movement. And then it it calls for comments. It says, let us know your thoughts and comments. So the other thing I want to say, I spoke to my friend Bavini before the call who can, she couldn't be here today. And she's who connected me to you two. Um, she's who connected me to you, Martin and Marvina. Mm. And I said, Bavini, uh, can you come today? And she said, no. I said, is there anything that you'd like me to bring into the space on your behalf? And she said, yes, the death of George Floyd. And then I had a pause to just to just like feel that for a moment and think of his family and his friends and relatives. And it made me think of my sister who died in in March 2018 and she was she was killed in Rojava in northern Syria. And she was hit by a net by a Turkish airstrike and she was blown up and killed. And she was there because she was volunteering as an international volunteer for the People's Protection Unit, um, the Kurdish People's Protection Unit, and she joined uh, a women's armed unit. And she made the news and BBC made a documentary about her and her name was getting graffitied on walls. And um, and I said to Bavini, you know, yeah, it meant a lot to people and they called her a, a hero and a martyr and all of this, but I don't care about any of that stuff. I just wish she was here. And um, and I was just thinking about his family and yeah, like so many of us have been brought together this year, but there's a massive hole in the hearts of, of all those that, that loved him and knew him. So 
Yeah, it's hard to reconcile the loss of of people in that way. So that's what I've been thinking about. It's quite reflective, isn't it? It's... um... I just done a piece for BBC World Vision with Opal um, and um, this is the same conversation was being had, if you know what I mean. And um, it's, it's a lot when we reflect back at um, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's, it's a lot because we know that it's not just Joy Floyd that died. We know that there are so many other people that have died this year. We know that that's the one that sparked, ignited stuff this year. But a lot of us that have been part of Black Lives Matter movements know that we've been fighting for a couple of years. And sometimes if, just hearing the article saying, if you don't understand what racial justice is, again, quite condescending, because a lot of people know that we've been talking about this for years. Um, but there was one person this year that definitely brought all of us into this conversation in a united front. Is the action that happened to Joy Floyd new? No, it's not. The only difference now with what's happening is that people are recording it. That's the difference. And even in the past, there was recordings and there was videos but well, something is shifting in the equinox in the universe that's starting to cause this conversation to move the way it's moving. Um, yes, his daughter just turned up, had a party the other day and a celebrity kind of threw her a party. Um, and I was just thinking about those are the kind of news I want to hear. How's the family doing? How is the family doing? It's Christmas. Bryna Taylor had some beautiful picture last year, you know, in front of a fireplace. And my girl didn't do anything. No one's talking that much about her. Um, we, we know that that disparity is that we talk about. And if you think about it, it was all men in the times, <laughs> um, again, being celebrated. But I think that equality of that conversation, it needs to be um, reflected on. But at that point, I'll stop, really. I would like to know what Uncle Martin thinks. Um, firstly, I think my, my first thoughts about George Floyd is that when I first saw the footage, the first 30 seconds of it was all I could watch. Um, I think it went on for, for nearly, was it eight minutes or so? I think that whole, the whole drama of it, the whole episode. And for me as a black man watching that, I I thought as though, hello, are you still there? Yeah, we're still yeah. there. I, yeah. I couldn't watch it at all. I'm, I, I, I'm going to hold my hands up. I couldn't, I didn't watch it at all. It, it, wow, it, it was like a snuff film. I, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to watch it. It was, it was, because mm. it, it gave me a real feeling of dread in my stomach. That on on different levels. That firstly, how could another human being treat another human being in that fashion, in such a very blasé kind of way? when I saw the expression on that, on that white policeman's face, I thought there's something non-human about the way you're acting in this situation. Um, and, and part of me thought it was symbolic of sort of white, the white system actually kind of indicating that we will go to any lengths to keep you down. Mm. Uh, another thing I thought is that that could be me as the victim of that, of white society's actions towards black people, specifically me and other people that look like me. And part of me just felt sickened that again, there's an inhumane aspect ingredient that in that moment kind of encapsulated all that's gone on before in terms of hundreds of years of persecution um, of mistreatment, of, of being hanged, of being slaughtered, of being raped, um, all kinds of murderous things going on, that somehow at this moment in time, 
doesn't seem to be reflected on in, a, in an in-depth and adequate way so that it can be solved because that indicates to me that they want it to continue. Um, and even, even today, I'm not even sure as to what is actually happening with that case. Um, I think they're in custody, but, you know, it's not been in court, I don't think. It's not actually at the forefront in terms of a solution. No one's sure as to what's happening to those officers, the one, the one that did it and the ones that stood by watching it while it was going on, you know. Um, so I think, I think that the, 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 that action really got me, it got me it, it, uh, riled up in a way in that something has to be done, hence me wanting to go out and join certain groups, get involved in some protests, link up with people that really find this a problem one that we all need to try to solve. Um, so I'm, I was seeking people who almost could console me um, at a time when I felt as though possibly I was isolated. Um, and I think I found some comrades who can kind of help me to, to be optimistic about seeking some solutions. Um, and I think that that's been a, a good thing that's come out of it. But the actual event itself, it, it really did. It sickened me. It really made me feel vile almost, like vile was coming up. It was horrible. Horrible. It's almost like a trauma bond. This is what we don't talk about. We all are sharing trauma bonds. We all are kind of, and we, I think I like the way Hester kind of explained that as it was a snuff film. Mm. fortunately for black people we don't get a space to stop our trigger points we get triggered but we carry on because our life is a trigger naturally seeing all these different things happen let's say stop and search seeing a young boy being punched in Tottenham seeing we constantly the stories is every week mm. we if you notice in our circles we, we constantly have videos being shared of horrible things happening to black people and we don't think about the mental impact. And I love what you said. I was looking for people to connect with because I felt like that there's that craving in your heart that does anybody see this? Can I take a mental health day? Can I just tap out? Did my manager ask me if I'm okay? Did my work colleagues understand this, my, this was a lot? Did things change? There, there's that thing. And we, we're trying to find a community that can let us understand like be ourselves in that space to say I'm hurting and I never knew him I'm hurting mm. and I've never met him and I'm hurting because I could see my dad my brother in my case my son yes. who's cute now who's cute now because he's eight who's not a threat now but mm. you're thinking I remember I did a, a session at school um, in, in, in a college and I've tried it in the university just to see whether they will pick up on it because I also understand that the George Floyd thing is in everybody's mind but imagine if you remove George, George Floyd's name and imagine if you wrote it in such a um, Shakespeare way <laughs> and yeah. imagine if you say what does this show you about society and the funny thing about that process the young people came up with some dynamic things saying well, it could be seen as race, did not talk about race, did not talk about color, just told them the same story in a different way and wanted them to explain what in society it was done, it was done um, to really see how they can pick what oppression looks like. Mm. And in that process of doing it where move Joy Floyd, move color. And I remember during the description, they were like, doesn't matter whether it was a man and a woman. I said, remove that. Doesn't mm. matter if um, the person was black or white. I said, remove that. Doesn't matter if they were rich or poor. I said, remove that. Let's now just talk about it from human to human. Mm. And they go, it's an oppressive system. And I think my favorite description that happened in that process was um, a young girl saying, it's almost like the, the knee on the neck it's, it's almost like the system holding you down and telling you your voice doesn't matter mm. and being able to crush your voice so you have no longer no influence. 
obviously they didn't know I was talking about George Floyd, but like at the end of the situation, I then said, significance, George Floyd. Everybody said, wow, we get it. Mm. And well, that's, know, that's powerful there. Well, you know, there's, there's two things that come to my mind is that it was very much a, a public lynching. Um, yes. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, and pictures that I've seen of, of lynchings that happened in the Deep South, for example, were images of the whole family being there, young children, uh, women, men, all looking at this black man, it would be ordinarily, hanging from a, that poplar tree and a child watching it like it was, they're watching a, a Disney movie. Um, and, and the thing about it, and someone said, if it was a, a dog or a, a cat that they had strung up in the dog. same way, that child would be traumatized. But somehow the system has told that child, this human being in front of you is nothing. They're not worth your, your time. Your, they're not worth your empathy. They're not worth your, your sorrow or your, 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 your support right now. Um, and, and for that to be an ongoing thing, even up to today, is, is frightening. Um, it's funny you talked about that animal. Lesson. I think when you talk about animal, sorry, I, that just really triggered me in that sense of even a dolphin and a dog has an ally that they know mm. that they have an ally. But the black man and the black woman and the black race, we've got so many people that claim to be allies, but we don't know. There's no way for me to know that person is an ally because everybody's so performative in the mm. space nowadays. So mm. we need to get to that point where we know who's fighting for us clearly. Because sometimes we carry this problem to people and thinking that because they, I'm happy, like Hester, you're my ally. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. But we know in the spaces that we're in, we've got a lot of performative allies the Black mm. Squares allies, the one that just posted and now we've never heard anything about them allies, the ones that their companies are still not changing their policies allies. Remember when George died, did you remember how many companies came out <laughs> with Black mm. Lives Matter statements? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. And at first you think, oh, is that change? And then you see how they revert. A good example is the fact that Tesco shot an advert and had black people in it but reverted <laughs> do you understand mm -hmm. what I mean um, the, these little things are what performative activism is where look at me I'm here you know um, at a protest and some people use that as their woke quota so we need to definitely have more allies coming to the front because the importance of allies in the Joy Floyd situation is there needed to be another voice of reasoning it needed to be another person that just needed to move him up. Say, bro, get off him now. Eight mm. minutes. And you don't know how long it would have been they started before they started filming. Well, well, another another frightening thing was the fact that I think one of the gentlemen was uh, you could call him a man of color himself. He was, I think he was Chinese he, um, Asian or Asian. Chinese, Asian extraction. Yeah. And, and so, the shopkeeper was Arabic. Come on. So, you know, looking at, again, the concept of allies, do, do they see themselves in George Floyd at that moment? Um, because they're not and, and part of the fabric, per se, are they, in terms of how the society sees them? But yet they're unwilling to be involved in terms of solving that issue. Um, you know, it, it, it's another thing I, I'd like to say is, um, you, you mentioned Shakespearean kind of perspective, and, and it reminds me of the scene where, You've got Romeo, mm -hmm. Romeo wanting revenge on, I think it's Tybalt, because Tybalt kills Mercutio. Yeah. In that scene, even, you know, obviously he's, he's going up with Juliet, who is Tybalt's uh, family. So he doesn't want to be involved in the idea of taking Tybalt's life, but he's almost drawn into the idea of seeking revenge because he needs to be seen to be a man who will gain honour on behalf of his friend Mercutio. And I think when we look at the way white society operates, 
they paint these actions of violence and of malice as honorable because they seem to be fighting for something that they believe is true. But it's not a story that is true. It's just a story they're buying into because they want it to be true. Um, but I think part of the, they must be questioning that whole action based on that narrative. They have well, to black, be. black bodies are meant to be. Uh, <laughs> over history has been showing that we are entertainment even in our deaths. We are entertainment even in our life. Like we are there for their own guilty pleasure, which is not guilty. The mm. fact that you you described it as um, people need to recognize it's not that long ago that they used to watch as we got lynched. Children would watch that. Yeah, you said yeah. that. I, I'm gonna let people let us sink in because that's why with the Joy Floyd thing, I had some young people that were like, yeah, they've been always. I love young people because there's no filter. They don't. <laughs> they really would just say. Because, but this always happens. Like, why aren't you guys doing something? And I'm like, but we've been doing because we have these challenging conversations in school. And yeah. I remember, like, there was this um, young person that just felt this can never happen to a white person. Mm. And I was like, no, it can't. I go, it can't. And uh, a good example was my daughter. We were talking about something about Christmas because Christmas is next week. And she was like, mom. Can I ask you a question? I go, what? Okay, go on. And when a child tells you that, you need to be worried because you don't know what's coming. You honestly don't know how deep it is. And she said, you know Santa, yeah? I said, yeah. He's white, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, he is. Goes, isn't he trespassing by just coming to our house like that? Is that what white privilege is? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, and he goes, not going to lie. And she goes, I go, okay. And it goes deeper. She goes, and the fact he has these elves just working all true, like, it's not modern day slavery. I was no. just like, she goes, I don't know if I want to get any present from this guy this year. Because, <laughs> again, isn't he meant to be shielding? Like, <laughs> like she's so uh, smart. She's so well, smart. It's, oh the way she, it's the way she twisted it. Like, and it's funny because I was in another meeting today and I was trying to explain to them that she was thinking um, her brother, I think she's getting to that age where she's like, I don't know if Santa exists and everything, but if he does, I'm just wondering that if it was a black man, because I showed her Rasta Claus. Rasta Claus is amazing. He's um, Clive. He's an amazing musician in Leeds here. Um, and she was like, that that makes sense because we we that's normally what we do. But when she was thinking about Santa, this, how come it was white? And why is it only white people that they say give gifts? But every gift that in the history has been given by white people has come with a different kind of connotation. Um, mm -hmm. And that for me just felt like I actually started thinking, have I done something wrong here? Because I've <laughs> raised a child who now is thinking about trespassing and the fact that if Santa was black, he would be dead by now. She's seen through the she's seen through the stories though. Like you've raised a critical thinker. She's, she knows what critical thinking is, and she's what nine. She's nine. Um, nine. She's and nine. you know when you were talking about the children in the school and how you were saying, you know, remove the the race, remove this, and uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking, in this situation of 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 a man being killed in the street, someone would have stopped it someone would have stopped it if he was white. Why did no one stop it? Again, I and think... You, you, and you're talking about, sorry, Martin, like you're talking about the lynching. Like, why, why did the crowd never step forward and say no? Why did the... And, you know, torturing, torturing an animal, you, someone, someone, you know, someone's got to step forward and, and say say no I mean maybe it's a child in me as well going like you know why why is it happening why did no one save that man why the silence we're and not human well, we're the, not human to them yeah and you, you're indoctrinated into a, a belief system that actually supports the idea of us being less than human yep. um, 
you know, if, if you're if you're able to be sold on some kind of uh, platform, uh, greased down, uh, made to look as though you're worth, I don't know, $100 or $500 and sold off as property, um, that, that modus operandi doesn't really change. The context may change, but there's still a selling of you, isn't there? Um, as low, low um, paid employment, um, as a person that works for free in an incarcerated situation, um, as a person who gets minimal wage in terms of welfare state, homeless people, um, black people are amongst those numbers disproportionately. Mm -hmm. So across the board, that, that belief system is continued. Um, and I think the American system is, is very acute at that, or very sharp at that, because what they then tell you, it's your fault. Um, you have an opportunity to better yourself in a meritocratic system. And if you're destitute, if you're not the one who's working in the best paid job, if you haven't got any qualifications, that's not our fault. You haven't done the best that you should do. Um, and that's part of the lie as well, isn't it? You know, it is. Um, it's a narrative being written for us. Like we're in Great Britain and I, um, I just done a piece on Diverse Food Bank. And someone was like, well, beggars should not be choosers. You know what I mean? Like, mm. um, but I'm like, it, how is it logical that people think black and brown people do not need food in food banks? Is it only white people that have yeah. to access food bank? So that means you don't even think about the food requirement for any other person other than yourself. Mm. So let's not lie now. Imagine now I'm broke. Imagine, not even imagine, a couple of months ago, I was in a situation where, like, I was broke. I know, it's hard to believe, but it happens sometimes. <laughs> um, I had an injury from work. I got bottled in face while working with young people. And I had to take um, some time off and return all my funding to funders. And in that period, obviously, from having a lot to not having anything and being sick, I had to access a food bank. Mm. And I'm not going to lie to you, that period, and I'm, I'm not ashamed because I want any black person hearing this, if ever you're in need, you should go and get some help. You mm. can go and access services because you paid into it. You've paid into it. But the process I went made me feel quite humiliated. I actually felt more depressed. Mm. I actually felt more sad. No offense to beans and toast, but not going to lie. The options were so not me. It made me even more sad just seeing what options I had. And like right now, that's given me a, an opportunity now where I'm doing a diverse food bank where there's some plantains there, you know, some black eyed beans, some okra and some scotch bonnet inside the normal mm. food parcel and a, yeah, some yam and sweet potato. Um, mm. And just, you know, like, even if someone is in their worst day and a hard dough bread, just in case, just for those, in my mind, it was, yes, it cost a little bit more. But now I know that people that are black, I remember someone coming to the food bank last week and she was Nigerian and she came through and she was like, um, is there anything that you can give? And I brought pounded yam out and I brought some acra and I brought like team tomatoes so she can make her stew and everything. And I had Indomie inside that pack. This woman started bawling out, crying, because it was the little things for her. She had already felt bad to come to the place to collect food. But then not only did she come, she found her food. And we all need to start thinking about that. So it's not about just thinking about George Floyd. What are you going to do after George Floyd? Who are the George Floyds of your community that you're not talking about? Mm. Look at that, the black woman that starved in her house, you know? because she was a refugee or is it an asylum seeker yes so um i think i think was she she was was she a prostitute was she i think she was is that right during the, the lockdown and then she couldn't come out to get I money you, Martin. Living on bread she was living on bread or something i think that she just is it the, one, the one that she had a daughter in the house too yeah the she baby. had a, just alive just about alive that's right and the mum died she died in the house yeah I think she was a the, it was in the summer. I don't. Yeah, I'm thinking of that story that she was. A, I thought she was a asylum seeker. Oh, and, okay. Um, and she had story. been. She was basically yeah forgotten, forgotten by the state, and uh, she had a one year old daughter. 
um, when you're a child, maybe it wasn't a daughter. Forgive me, if I got that wrong. But, it was a um, daughter. It was a daughter. Yeah. Just and, alive. Yeah. Just alive. The daughter. She died, isn't it? I think. Yeah. We yeah. can't see you me. anymore, Martin. Oh, sorry. Can't see Here you. Here am. Sorry. <laughs> no. But yeah. so, go, go, Hester. Oh well, it's about the silence. I just wanted to come back to that because I'm so I'm so inspired and happy to hear you talk about the food bank, Marvina, because um, our family has also needed food donations, and it's it's sad. It's tinned. It's tinned food. It's uh, it's it's fruit that's you know in syrup or whatever. It's it's sad vegetable. I mean, I opened a tin of vegetables, and it, yeah, beggars can't be choosers exactly, but. It's the humiliation and then thinking, oh, all right, yeah, it's one of, fan- one of your five a day. It's, it's, it's baby carrots and peas, but a sweet potato. Like, I nearly cried when you were just talking like that because, <laughs> you know, and tin tomatoes and, what, you know, what about some rice maybe, um, you know, it's, it's pasta. I mean, we got, we actually, we got baked potatoes from, we got potatoes from the school and just doing baked potatoes last night was good, but... Um, what you're creating, Marvina, and how you're how you're educating as well. I'm like, and so I celebrate you. I just celebrate you. I'm just so inspired. Um, and I want to encourage white people watching this, if possible. Like, I hear so many people going, "Oh, I don't know what to do, or I don't know what to say, or like, I'm gonna get it wrong." But you can't be silent. Like, you have no right to be silent. I feel silence that way. is consent. Silence it's is consent. consent. The silence like... is violence. It's like you, you can't you can't watch. You can't be a you can't be that person in the crowd watching the lynching and you know you can't. No. It, it's it's like. But you know you know what you know what I think it takes. I think it takes um, a case for. I was reading about the Neomachian um, ethics today by Aristotle, and part of it is about virtues um mm. and virtues aren't necessarily about um good and evil bad or you know or good it's what it's more about is your action based on observation um and and you have to be involved in things based on what you're seeing and who you're involving yourself with and that's how you become a, a virtuous person um you know, the person I always think about is a man like Martin Luther King Jr., who I think he was virtuous because despite the fact that the system was saying he was wrong, he saw something beyond the system. He wasn't listening to what the system was telling him he should be. He could see that he could be more than. Um, hence his dream was for, you know, black and white to stand side by side and have equal measure and equal access to all those things that will enable him to become a human being. Um, so I think oftentimes when we're observing these actions by the negative aspect of the system, your virtuous self through observation can see we need to fight that because there's something not right with what I'm looking at. Um, you know, and, and, and oftentimes a guy like, um, Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick, the American football player, who was on his own kneeling and was told you're, you're out of order. Just, just shut up. You're getting paid. You know, play your American football, don't say a thing, don't get political. But he kept kneeling and now everyone kneels. And do you know what's funny about that thing you've just said there? So there's two things I want to pick up that you talked about virtue. So mm. I'm a scrum, I'm, I'm studying, um, re, re-studying to become like a scrum agile coach, really. Mm. And with the agile coach, the three, the five things you need, the five pillars or the values is, you know, the first thing, let me let me just get this right before I say anything. The first thing is you need to be committed. So commitment mm. is so important in yeah. whatever project you do. And maybe this should help anyone listening. Another thing, you need to have courage. Courage mm. is very like, for us, I think with white silence, it's normally around that commitment to change and the courage to actually take action. Mm. And then when you choose to take action, you need to be focused be very focused on what action you're planning to do to mm. make a difference because this has to lie independently and then there needs to be an openness to, uh, to say I don't know what I don't know but I'm willing to learn and then the last part is respect these are the core values of Scrum though I know it sounds crazy that that's a project management tool but like 
it's something that I think that maybe in community settings, in activism, maybe we need to start applying that. Can you imagine if when you're managing projects for these big companies, that's their core values of how they work. They want you to have commitment because a lot of activism, they're not committed. They're here today, they're kumbasa with everything. Sometimes I prefer to say to people, if you're fighting for the black people, make sure you do your 10,000 hours. Before you do any job, you have to have your 10,000 hours expertise, right? Mm. But because everyone is jumping from everything to the other, no offense that you don't need to. If you find an intersectional way of doing it, that's great, because that's what I'm doing. I'm also going to say, Martin, something you touched on that is very important is I've also had to deal with unlearning some of my own unconscious bias. Mm. I've also had to re-educate myself on other issues that are pertaining to like racial inequalities that don't look like me. But mm. then I make sure I say to people that, don't get me wrong, I'm supporting you in what you're doing, but I'm going to always tell you that your pain is my pain. I'm going to empathize and I want to be your ally. And I learn how to be an ally. And I think I'm not the best ally I could be, but I try to be a, the, a good one. And when I'm corrected, I don't stand there and go, oh, you know what? I, I don't think that's right. Or I don't get in my feelings. It's not about your feelings. Please keep your feelings and your white tears in your corner. Nobody needs it at all. Don't tell me that me telling you that what you did. Can you imagine this rubbish sometimes? Um, dear white people, please listen to this. Can you imagine if I slap you? Yeah. I slapped you like I mean the one with my five fingers showing on your face, yeah? And then imagine after doing that, I say slapping you hurts me. Are you mad? Hmm. That's what they do to black people all the time. Yeah. yeah. Me slapping you hurts me. Please, I beg. That's a lot. It's, this, it's the racism subversion. And it's uh, she talks about it in the White Fragility book a lot. And... Um, they, they, they do the example of an emergency sur services rushing to the scene of, the, you know, somebody's been hit by the car and they go and rush and, and comfort the driver while the, while the victim's there, you know, bleeding and lying on the street. And, it, and it, the, even bringing up the word racism or whatever, it, and then it suddenly becomes about white distress, white discomfort, uh, white anxiety, um, Elisa's joined us. I know you just want to listen. Uh, you're not going to speak right now, but um, that's something that I've been really struggling with in the justice group that I'm in, that there's a such reluctance or resistance to, to stop the, well, I feel, what about me? I'm the, and yeah, we don't know what we don't know. Marvina, you just put that just so perfectly in, in all spaces, activism, families friendships we have to say i don't know i don't know any of this and be open to learning like uh someone me and elisa on this sort of this strategy assembly thing and somebody was saying like you can't walk into the space saying i know it all and this movement will never grow these people will never um get anywhere if you think your learning is finished you know i think you're i think you're hitting a really good point there you know hester um, if we're looking at what so white society is, you just stated white fragility. Okay. When a person is fragile, they like to be at the centre of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, the term narcissistic is what I think a real fragile person is about because yeah. they're not really willing to listen or have dialogue because they feel they know it all already. And everything that they experience is what other people need to be experiencing as well. And if there's an other, a different kind of experience from their own, they want to shut it down because it's like, you're now questioning their reality, their truth, their story. Um, that's why oftentimes when you, when you talk about race, it gets shut down. There's no dialogue about it because they can't have another narrative alongside their own. It's too much for them, um, for their kind of central story to be questioned. It's, it's very um, egotistic. It's like I was reading this book. Well, listen to this interview, this guy called uh, Gabriel Cruz. I think I, I think I discussed him last time. He's a Polish kid. 
Um, and he's written a book called um, Who They Was, I think it's called. And he said in this interview that your identity is just something that cloaks yourself, your true self. So people create identities which are the most fragile part of who you are. The real part of you, yourself, is what you really need to find because that's the eternal part of you. Um, but I think white society is, is just creating and recreating these images to suit different scenarios. That's why Native Americans said white men speak with forked tongue because each moment they'll say one thing but then act in a completely different way from what they said. Oh my gosh, sorry. You know what, please let me come on this one. This one here, this one here, that right there <laughs> is the racial gaslighting to the finest. Of, to the full. I, I can't. I'm, to the fullness, be honest to you. We used to joke about this in Nigeria. When a white man say good morning, you need to go outside and check it. <laughs> check the daytime. <laughs> you need to go outside and check it. That's because funny. in that one bread, <laughs> if they say don't worry, you'll be safe. Know that wow. you need to be worried. You because you'll be, be in worried. a box. <laughs> and imagine that was how you grew up, where you're just thinking. So obviously I grew up with my own racial bias. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to lie about it. But then yeah. I was colonized by them. So like, bruh, I, I, I'm unpacking my own trauma. And that's the thing people don't understand. Mm. To have your language stolen from you, you, for you, I got to learn A was apple. We didn't have no apple in Nigeria. Wow. <laughs> so like, <laughs> listen, that, that, that's how indoctrinated it is. Wow. We used to get beat in school if we spoke, even till now, there's certain schools in Nigeria, if you don't speak English, you get beats in class. You're mm. meant to speak English in school. Mm. You can't speak the language. You can't speak broken English. It is seen all inappropriate. That's how much. We, we still have the sodomite law in Nigeria because mm. of who? But now we are the ones that are barbaric. Yeah? Before they came, we didn't have any problem. No one was watching who was gay or not gay or doing whatever they're doing in their life. No one cared. British came. Now that's a lot. So we need to think about the social impact of all these things over the years yes. on our life and how it's almost like when you see a child has been neglected and a child has gone through um, interim care order and gone through all these things, that child, when they become an adult, we all know that they, they, they're going to go through life in a different kind of sphere. Do you understand mm. what I mean? And there's support there. Where's the support for black people? Yeah. I'm well, going to ask you, Martin, at work, did anyone ask you, how are you feeling? Do you need time off? No, not at all. No. <laughs> but I, 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 I would realise that they wouldn't see fit to ask me that. I'd have to ask myself that question. And that's what I've grown to become, someone who's Ooh. very silent, to be able to see what I need. In a, in, a, in a system that I've analysed, I think, well enough to know it's not for me. It has never been for me. It's always tried to miseducate and rearrange my thought process about me being proud of who I am to make me feel as though I need to not be proud of who I am. Um, and you have to look outside of it to gain your real, your real strength. Um, and it's I think, almost like I you think, don't deserve, you don't feel like you deserve that because if you've been told for years that you don't deserve that support. In fact, how do you know what you deserve if the system has never given it to you? Well, that, that, that is because you have to look at those that are, are, are going to empower you. There are people in your, in your community... Oh, you're cutting out a bit, Martin. ...that know the truth and that are going to speak... Sorry, that, that they're really for you. And we said, and, you know, I said before, when I was looking at the George Floyd thing, that I felt so disempowered, so um, angry or so bitter, I had to find some allies and some comrades who actually helped to support me with a light-mindedness about this is what we're fighting against. This is wrong. Um, and I think that's what I have always tried to find. A voice or words that are going to empower me and make me feel better about who I am despite what's being said about me 
um, or other people that look exactly like me. But there's a burnout um, that comes with that, though. And I found that, you know, I found that. It's crazy that I feel like Sorry, we also need again? to talk. We need to talk about the burnout, the burnout culture for us as activists. In retrospect, Joy Floyd happened, but for a lot of us, um, since Joy Floyd died, we've not stopped. I've not stopped. I don't know what stopping looks like now because it seems like what we've been seeing, other people are now seeing. And then there's a heightened society that's made us, even though we in our little bubbles think we're united, with the society is divided. It is divided. No because, and people, I had to make that explanation about BLM versus BLM. And someone said, what do you mean? Black Lives Matter versus Blue Life Matter. I didn't know whenever blue life were in danger, you know, in my, in all the years that we've known, blue life has not been in danger. Like the way, yes, they do go through problems. Let me say that. Yes, they, they might get targeted from time to time. Let's say that. But we, we are, we are walking target practice. Every day, a black person is a walking target practice. Let's take it now to Nigeria, right? Everyone's saying, okay, how does this link to NSARS UK and, we learned our police brutality from who? Who trained the police forces in Nigeria? The British. Who gave them the guns? So the guns and stuff came from those areas. Like, we need to see the impact of this white privilege and fragility on a whole. Because we're saying NSARS, NSARS, NSARS. But for me, it's who gave the resources to enable? Sometimes you need to look at the root of the problem and be able to address it and we, how are we going to have change if I feel like sometimes we're preaching to the converted we're preaching to people that we know already I don't want to do that no more I want to go to the ones that are on the fence the nice white people because you know you, you know you're there the nice white people that I'm not racist but people please listen it's not I'm not even going to talk about violence you see the way you don't want no cats to die right and you don't want no dolphins to die and you don't want no dogs to die. Can you just think about me? The fact you say you don't want to even eat meat now because you think eating meat is very cruel. That's how black people dying is. That pain you're feeling, that thing you're feeling, can you just empathize with us? The ones that are going to church, you know, you believe in God, right? White Jesus. Guess what? He wasn't white, you know? I know, Bobble's boss. I'm so sorry. The guy doesn't look like anything you think he looks like. He might have actually looked like a refugee. Now, that being said, you've been praying to this guy as your ancestor, right? Can you now think that if George Floyd was a little bit lighter, he would pass the paperback test, it could be Jesus. So can you step in for him? Would you have saved him? Now I'm speaking to your religion. If you want to talk about Allah, would you have saved, you know, Belal? Let's talk. Let's go deep into that now. Everybody has a part to play in this. No one should be silent no more. If you don't know, go and learn. And also put a value on these people. Animals get more respect than black people do. And it's sad that we're ending the year and I still know, I still know that that's going to be something that carries on. And I wish I could say it doesn't in an ideal world. But yeah. But, well, I think, I think one, one thing we, we should take with us is that Sometimes when you're making a small movement, it can start off a big kind of ripple effect. Um, and oftentimes we believe that the small little increments that we're making isn't have enough of, a, of an impact. But I think even what we said last time is that oftentimes it's not for us in this immediate moment to see that kind of change we'd like, but it might be for the next generation and the generation after um, to actually see real fruit of the seeds that we're planting right now. Um, so I think oftentimes the effort that we're making, we can't see it as not having an impact. It's going to have some impact because it's moving in the right direction because the sentiment is there and the virtues are there because we can see what the problems are, but we can't, we can't be afraid to get involved in our small little way. Um, and that is, that's the beauty, I think, of being a person who, who cares and has empathy um, because you want to see change even though you might not see it immediately, you know. That's what I think. 
Definitely, definitely. Self care, self care, though. Let's talk about self care. Share a this bit. Line. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because we we did a bit of that yesterday. Yesterday, Wednesday. Oh. It was it was very special. Um, but you've reminded me of this line, Martin. And there's this guy, and he's talking about um, eldership in times of crisis and like community mindedness that that's not there. And he and he says, "Are you up for this work?" And then he goes, um, I will not live to taste the wine, but I will plant the vine. And mm. it's that knowing that you're not going to get any benefit from this work, but you've said it today and and last week, you know, it's the next generation or the next generation. And mm. like, are you, you know, to yeah. whoever's listening, are you, are you, are you ready for that? Are you up for that work? Because yeah. no, no change will come unless we're all in it together. Yeah. And we, we, we start, I started today really wanting to sort of celebrate what's happened in the last year because there has been, I've met you guys, like there's yeah. a great coming together of people, um, great conversations. Uh, Charlotte's not here today, but she was, um, you know, in, in, in Hackney the, um, they, and Harringay and Tottenham, they, they were sitting together strangers just sitting together on the grass talking talking mm. about everything that these topics are raising for us and my friend Justine said what she'd love in the Black Lives Matter movement is just to see marches of, like in the white community just only white people just coming out and and like not the uh what did you call it the, the performative yeah no performative activism no, and you yeah, know that's beautiful that, that I've been seeing like, there. Yeah, in, in authenticity, because there was some town, there was a white town, Shoreham by Sea. They did they did a Black Lives Matter protest. Everyone in that town is white. And I've I tell you, I did I watched a video and I've I felt a little bit like okay, are they, are they are they still going out on the street? Was it just that moment, you know? <laughs> oh, I swear to be honest to you, I think I'm not gonna lie, I feel selfish after hearing that quote. I want I want to see it. I want to see the change. I'm not gonna lie. Like 400. Like we've been going through this. I, I, if before I die, I want to see it. I don't want to be like the Martin Luther King, where so you'd be like, he died for this. Nah, bruh. I want to live for this. <laughs> I want to be there. I want to be able to see my children have an equitable society. And now I'm getting emotional because that's the thing, right? Like. Are we ready for this work? Yes. But I don't want to die while I'm doing it. But you know I, I what? Want... <laughs> you, 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 you talk about Martin Luther King. I think one of his last speeches, he did state that he, he, his eyes have seen the light, but he, would, he will not get to that promised land with oh, the people. No. He stated that. And, and I always think about Moses, yeah. you know, the people in the, in, you know, in, in the so-called wilderness, to that promise and he never got there either um but, that, but but he kind of released them from their shackles and, and headed them towards a, a better direction arguably um but, but bro aren't you tired though like that notion be honest to you like i swear down i know is the reality of it but let's now put it in perspective of how many people have died for us to be here how many ancestors they're now our ancestors like like, like for real though, like if we keep going like this, that means my kids might not see it. If we keep going like this, do you understand what I mean? It's the state yeah. of emergency. Well, like, well, one thing I think I often look to is, is Buddhism. And Buddhism indicates that life is, is, um, is not only a struggle, but it's suffering. Life is suffering. And I think oftentimes when we're given this impression of, of, I suppose gaining happiness, because that's again, you know, people like Jeremy Bentham and and those kind of uh, enlightenment thinkers, they had this concept that happiness is the ultimate sort of good we should be aiming for. But some days you get up, you think I don't really feel that great today, but I'm going to get out into the world and I'm going to do the best I can. And oftentimes when you do that, by the end of that day, you can reflect and think, right, what am I grateful for today? Which, I, which is the thing that gives you your happiness. Um, so I think sometimes on, on reflection, there is a case for 
inevitably inevitably you having some sort of suffering in your life but yet you're struggling through you're making a, a a change you're making a difference again in the smallest way you can but who knows whose life you're changing so they step on and do an even bigger thing to rearrange things um we just don't know because we can't see tomorrow we can only see today it sounds very philosophical but I think that's the way I live. That's the way I make sense of the actions that I partake in on a daily basis. It's going to be hard, but it's a struggle, but it's going to be worth it in the end. It has to be. It's hard, man. It's, it's, it is. I, in the whole picture, I think today I'm being, the way you're talking is the way I naturally would talk and be like, yeah, we're just in this. But then today I'm just thinking... I've seen all these people not get to the promised land. I've seen them talk about it. But like enough people have done the work now. Can can we start reaping where we sowed? You know what I mean? Let's go back to that. Let's just reap some of the the benefits. So yeah, we're talking about the good achievements, the good achievement for this year. Honestly, I've met some amazing, amazing. I've met you, Martin. Like, that's good, Uncle Martin. I've met you. That's, <laughs> that's one achievement there. I've met my big sis, Hester. I've met, like, I've met some allies that I just think, I've met Rob, you know, I've met Amina. I've met, like, some, do you understand what I mean? I've met Tim. I've met, I've met Bavini, big sis Bavini. I've met people that I can say I've got family. And activism, you start creating your own little family. It's mm -hmm. literally it's a safety net, you know, you come into a space and then you'd be like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that person existed. Oh my gosh. And I'm not alone. And when you're doing this work, you're so alone because mm. you're, you're constantly making friends and enemies, but mostly enemies because people listen out of fear, not out of actually caring because they're listening how to, how to, it's like a narcissistic world. <laughs> I'm going back to what Uncle uh, Martin said. People mm. listen, and because you, I like my everyday racist me. I, I like my racist known and loud and proud of being a racist. But what we have is politically correct people that smile in your face. Um, yeah. That That's what it, yeah. it, the British smile, the British smile is the most strongest toxic thing you can imagine where you smile while hating me in the same breath. I, 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 I do understand that because I think I've, I've been, I've seen one, I could say one white person that's quite close to me who only really thought the issues to do with black people were real when only when Black Lives Matter became something that was almost mainstream. And in fact, in some way became quite fashionable as in terms of the fist <laughs> that was being used as an icon, the marches that were ongoing, um, you know, young people getting involved in it to highlight the fact that they were embittered about this. But this one person now kind of sees black issues as a, as a, a racism, as a problem. Whereas before it was just a chip on, on a black person's shoulders. That's uh. not really there. Um, are you imagining it? That kind of question. Gaslighting um, again. Gas in many respects, but, yeah, be because I think they didn't see their own prejudices. And it's, it no. took Black Lives Matter to make them see, oh, am I involved in this just as much as any other white person? You know. I, I remember having someone come in to apologise to me. Be honest to you, I didn't know, actually, maybe I'm already getting to the promised land. I had an employer, I had someone I worked with for years who, be honest to you, was the most horrible, I'm not racist, but kind of racist. And this year, after I did my speech, because um, on Black Lives Matter, I wasn't talking to them, but you know, conscience always that catches people, right? And mm. um, this person came to me like five days later and re said to me, I realized I was part of your pain. Wow. I realized I caused your pain. Hmm. I'm coming to you and say, I've also been a blocker to your progression. Wow. I am deeply sorry. 
and I'm saying it like it almost felt like I was hearing them say it and in a way I was thinking are you just saying it because you're scared I'm gonna out you <laughs> but I've known about I've never outed you I'm the type sometimes I know how to out people but like sometimes you just think you can't out someone that doesn't know that they're doing something wrong and to me that meant a big shift because it's almost seeing that thing where they say your trial will become a testimony so you had to mm. go through that suffering because you know that and as horrible mm. as it sounds now going back to what you said that are you ready for the work and mm. um what um, hester and what you said martin about knowing the the impact of you might not taste the glory now but it will still have an impact Mm. this situation this person did to me was like five years ago I'm not going to lie to you I forgot about it I forgot it because with black people things happen to us we just we're like eh it happens and we, 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 we're we used to it so we're not used to people coming back and saying I'm sorry I was wrong how do I fix it and that's another thing for allies when you're listening to this when you make a mistake the first thing you need to say I'm sorry Mm. I was wrong and the next thing is how do I fix it not can you help me fix it how do I fix it what's and what I said to them I go well and this is now me being cheeky do you have a budget and when I said do you have a budget it was clear it's not your normal unconscious bias training you need are you willing to go to Racial Justice Network? Are you willing to go to set in services to make sure that never happens? And they said, yes. And I go, fair enough. There you go. Go to these contacts. They will help you. And they were, and they were just talking from themselves. They acknowledged their privilege and power. And they said, you trusted me. Mm. And at certain points that I was meant to be there for you. I watched systems oppress you and I was part of that system. And as you said, it was like that, your friend you were talking about. That mm. people don't understand, having friends that don't see you struggle mentally messes you up. It's like drowning and no one's sending you a lifeline because they don't see the water around you. It's the silence. It's the violence of that, of witnessing and not coming to sit to help i'm not talking about actually help or saving but not um stopping the harm the harm has to be stopped people have to step in the way of it if they can and see uh, speak up the, the the silence of white people is just it's, it, there's no place for it anymore no um, one's gonna like this one i'm gonna say the silence in climate justice space is deafening and heartbreaking the silence in no in climate justice spaces is deafening and heartbreaking. Yeah. Because when we talk about the earth, when we talk about the environment, when we talk about the people, we pick the people we talk about. The silence in climate justice spaces is deafening and heartbreaking. I'll leave it at that one there. Because they've got yeah, the resources, think- they've got the power, they've got the privilege. Why, why is green spaces so white? Why don't we use our voice and do something for others? Can they well, be I better think, allies? Well, I think, I think there's, there's a, a number of issues there that would, would force them not to want to rearrange the situation because they are, in a, <laughs> they are in that position of power. They are in that position of privilege. And Top often the when you eat well, you don't want that conveyor belt of food to stop, do you? You want it to continue. Oh. Sometimes when we look at why this plate, this part of the world is so plentiful, uh, you know, America is like 5%, I think, of this planet, but yet they consume something like 20% or 25% of all of it for just that one country. Um, so, you know, who's doing the work for them? Who, who are their servants? Who are their slaves? So that this conveyor belt continues, but do they see where it comes from? No. They just keep gorging and gorging and gorging. So people who are often confronted with these issues um, do not want the dialogue. They don't want to hear these negative messages. 
because that means it upsets their apple cart. It means they're going to have to relent. It means they're going to have to give up something. And they just don't want to because it's all about avarice and greed and a, an ego that's inflated. Um, and, and they're on a pedestal, I think. They believe that they are the masters and anyone else is, is a slave in a very unconscious way for some of them. Because some of them may present an idea that, oh, well, I give to charity or I've got a few black friends. Or That is the oh, most painful oh. word when people say it, you know, my friend's dog's auntie cat is black. That's how it sounds to me when people say that thing. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 or uh, you know, I've adopted um, a Chinese baby or a, an African child from Malawi. Um, I volunteered right. in Africa. I volunteered in Africa and I built a school. Yeah. Did the people in the village tell you to build a school? Did you do a consultation? Who's well, telling you, know, you this? Well, the funny thing now, you've got, you know, the whole, um, oh. was it comic, comic Relief? Now they're not sending people who are white and famous to Africa to kind of just have these PR opportunities with African impoverished anymore. They should they send can... Auntie Jean. They should sell Auntie Jean from Garvey Village. Those are the kind of people they need to send. They need Whoa. to send us that, they, like... That's Auntie Jean. There is um, there's so many amazing people. They can send Esther if they want to, or oh, yeah. stop the Magnesi. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. There, there's so many so other I, people they can be sending. I think Alfie. often it's a case of them <laughs> wanting to make out as though they're actually doing something that is yeah. better than those, those parts of the world. But on a grander scale, when you have an African nation that steps to the table to negotiate a better deal on on um, getting a better price for their bananas or any any other crop they have. They're just told, well, be quiet. You know, um, even when they have a position of authority, they're still told, well, you're not going to get the price you want. We're giving you that price at set because we want the betterment. That is what th is going on here. So the dialogue is not going to take place because they don't want to relent. They don't want to give up anything. Um, they need to acknowledge the privilege because even in Nigeria, as crap as it is, when if a white man, a white man who gets benefit here, can just wear a suit that knows nothing about nothing, can get on the plane and go and start posing like he knows what he's doing. And they will treat him because he's the master in their minds better than me that has more experience, more to offer, more to deliver. That way, obviously that's white man of privilege. Course. But it's so bad that- I heard, it's funny, I heard at work the other day, we were talking about um, the lack of, black and um, Asian and, and people of color within leadership positions, within SLT, senior lead, leader um, team positions. And um, it was the, um, uh, the uh, educational office, office of education that indicated, Ofsted I think it is, that um, they have to now start looking at what a school's makeup is in terms of leadership position, especially if the school has uh, a, a majority of black, Asian and ethnic minorities within the school. Um, because oftentimes those teachers who are of that type are going to be just middle managers um, and not in the kind of position to set the, the policy within the school. And I heard one teacher say, well, sometimes they just want to give the jobs to people of colour just to fill that quota and not because they can necessarily do the job. And I was like, and this is a white woman. This is a white woman. So it kind of indicates to me, wow, this is the sentiment, isn't it? You think because a person of colour is in that position, it's they're not because they're good enough. It's because they've been given it just it's to a fill a... Affirmative a, 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 action. Affirmative action is that, do you know what I mean? But do you know what I would say, advise people to do, I swear it down. This is another way I've been navigating my life. Allies are good, you know. If you can find allies in certain place you're working here, I could be in a meeting and someone would say something dumb. I'm just there sending a message straight to an ally that I know has power. Because I'm not going to lie, I like the allies with power, really. The ones that I know are going to be able to say, if they don't pick up on it, I will send a message to them and say, that's not okay to say. And then I will let them take the lead on what to do after that. So this, what you just talked about happened in a meeting I was in. And... The amazing thing about that ally, before I could even text them, they already came in and say, "Are you? You can't say that. Sorry, you can't do that." Exactly the same conversation you just said there. We mm. don't want to just hire a black person um, 
if they're not qualified for it and we don't want to progress a black person. I go, and the person goes, you can't say that. This was like the director of the company. You can't mm. say that because you're now assuming that our recruitment process will not get the best jet person for the job. And we will just do a tick box. Do you think we'll want to give someone a position of that kind of standards if they didn't have the right to do the job? Are, you, are we that fickle as an organization? And all I could see was this person. For me, I was just like so happy because everybody, as soon as they said that, we were looking at Marvina to respond. But sometimes you can't respond it, when you're the only token black person in the space, which we always are. So you're waiting for other people to speak. It's just like someone was asking me about curry goat the other day and I had to explain, I'm Nigerian. Ask me about your love rice and I will help you. I will tell you about it all the, day, all the days of your life. But well, is that well, assumption? <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny, you know, because that's one thing I actually said to them, that oftentimes when you have a person of colour in a position within a school that is heavily weighted in terms of Black, Asian and ethnic minorities, there's a cultural affinity going on. There's an understanding of those students more than a person maybe who isn't of that, that cultural base. Um, and I actually used the example of kissing your teeth amongst, you know, Students African and Africans kissing your teeth isn't necessarily a sign of disrespect. It can sometimes be a sign of frustration on your part because yep. maybe you're just not getting what you should, what you think you should be getting in relation to understanding um, a coping mechanism. It's a coping, it's a coping mechanism. It's, it's like coping char. Mechanism. yeah, it's you like just you... Off, You know what char. I mean? Because you're frustrated <laughs> at what's going on. It's not rudeness. But you get some teachers, especially white ones, who will say, oh, you're being rude and actually have a go at the child when the child is trying to explain. No, it wasn't. But yet they then get put in detention or even excluded sometimes. Look at the fact you're talking and your hands moving. I've had to learn. I have had to learn to put my hands and people don't understand. I literally sometimes have to sit on my hands when I'm talking so I don't move it. Well, you and know, well, that's a cultural they say, thing. They do, they do say not only cultural, but it's a creative thing as well. Someone who moves their hands in a very kind of gesticulating kind of way is actually expressing in the language. In fact, people who are more expressive, they move their hands. You see any politician that is considered to be good, they're oftentimes moving and they're gesturing and they're creating images to kind of bring people along with them. Um, that's just a sign they get of it. taught to do that. Do you think some people might get taught to do it so they come across like more, I don't know, intelligent? I, I, I mean, I can't believe I've just heard that, Marvina, and that's really hit me that like not moving your hands, learning not to. And it's reminding me there's an episode oh. of The Crown where they, they, they tie her, her hands to her side to teach wow. her not to move her hands. It's... I need to watch that, you know, I need to watch. But do you know what's funny about the whole thing is that the other day, and this is going to make you laugh, Uncle Martin, yeah? Mm. I was thinking, maybe I should go for this eloquent classes, you know? And the, the lady, wait, 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 wait. Let me explain. <laughs> First place. Let me go to, because for me, I think code switching, we need to love more up our game a little bit more sometimes. <laughs> because for us to even get into some of those rooms to influence change, we can't even make it through the door. So it's like you need to almost um, be the Trojan horse. And mm. unfortunate for me, I'm, I'm Marvina, in it, <laughs> And I feel like I need to maybe be more Marvina, you know what I mean? A little bit more softer, a little bit more... Don't change anything. Don't change, don't change anything at all. But Martin, you know, you know the struggle don't I'm talking change about. Anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, listen, I, kind of, I kind of get what Marvina's talking about, because oftentimes you have to, if you're in a setting, you have to play a role. To yeah. sue. And it sounds it sounds like you're giving up a part of you. But I think that's part of our skill as a black person. You can kind of rearrange yourself because you, you have to die to self. self. You have to die to self. self. Definitely. And mentally, it, it hurts because I think this year I realized and someone was just telling me the other day, you know, you've not straightened your hair all year. And I was like, rah, OK, go, you want your hair natural like a lot this I year. I celebrate that. I celebrate um, that. And That's normally, cool. I'm really ashamed of how big it is. I'm, I'm like, not going to lie to you. I've been told that it's wild. It's, and it still gets told that it's wild and it's big. And, you know, it's all the way out there. And this year, my son said, Mom, I want to get dreads. And 
if he had told me this, good things about Joy Floyd now, if he had told me this a year ago, I would think about his career prospects and I would think, no, I don't want you to have dreads. But like, I'm there like creaming his hair and getting it ready because that's his Christmas present for Kwanzaa. My boy's hair is going to be dreaded up because I feel like he has to be his most authentic self. Um, but at the same time, I know that the world would judge him differently for even something like his hair. I know, and Hester, you can't understand it when it comes to code switching. We as black people, honestly, can never be our 100% self in a space. Never, um, I don't know about, Martin might be, Uncle Martin might be different. We can't. Do you know what that feels like? Where you know people will never meet the real you. Yeah, you have, you have to present a certain image in relation to what they expect of you sometimes when you're in a space and I think I often sometimes see it as being bilingual where you know if you're yes. if you're in France you're going to speak French aren't you more so uh and, and in England you're going to speak English it's the same kind of thing where you have to represent a certain part of you that fits that context it's literally uh, like and, split personality it's it, and, it's, and it's part of the game people play people often play games um within within settings to so that they come across in a certain way to, to, so they can conduct themselves and get on with others. Um, it's, it's part of, it's part of being an adult. You know, what's that saying in the Bible? When I was, when I was a boy, I did boys things. I think so, man. Away those childish things, you know. So it's, it, the child is always in you, but, but you don't act the child when you're in the professional adult situation. You have to put that away, don't you? I'm yeah. going to change that scripture now into the blackness scripture. Mm. When I was black in Africa, I could think like a black African. But once I crossed and get on that plane and hit that city airport or Heathrow airport, I have to throw away everything that is of me. Yeah. That's the reality of being black. <sighs> that yeah. is painful, but that's our truth. Yeah, because you're, look, you're looked down <laughs> upon. You are. You are. You know, because I think, I think, um, I mean, your, your, your concept of your language being taken away from you and you're being forced to kind of take on another language that's part of your culture language and culture are intrinsically linked you know and without your language you don't really know who you are you know you're exactly. kind of lost in a lot of ways so you're right you, that that having to pack away a major part of who you are that you're proud of back home suddenly when you come here it's like that's not that's not something we do around here um and I find it quite ironic is that actually when we are here and we're quite bombastic, it's actually <laughs> white people that love that the most. When they're in carnival and you see them eat the jerk chicken and the curry goat and the roti and That's the the, dance. And exactly. Like, come out. They're just alive. But you know we're I mean? there for entertainment. See, our culture is a costume that can be put on and taken off. It's okay to be black until it's not okay to be black. Does mm. that make sense? And then yeah. someone, I was talking about colorism and people don't get this, that my son is a little bit lighter than my daughter, just a little bit, like at least two shades. So he will be paperback, he would be paperback test wise, he will be on the other side. While my daughter looks like me and you, Uncle Martin, right? Mm. And even the way our family make comments it's all part of that colonial mind. If George Floyd was like, he had the wide nose, he had, you know, the, the big black man. All I thought about was slavery when I think about George. You know, like the alpha male being made and broken in front mm -hmm. of the public eye to let you know your yes. place. Yes. That you don't, you don't stand a chance in this situation because that was the prime of your community. That was mm. the strongest did you see how big he was compared to the police officer? I swear yeah, he, down. He was, yeah. You just think, so all this gym you're going to, all the people in my head, that's what one of the guys that broke down. A lot of black men are going through mental trauma because of what happened to George. Let's talk about that. Because this young man broke down. He goes, can you see how hench my brother was? Can you see how big he was? And can you see how they broke him down? What's that guy in the UK that saved the white man on his shoulder? What's his name again? Patrick yes, Hutchison. Yes, yes, yes. And I know he's got a lot of blacks from some of the community saying, okay, listen, the only reason you're famous is because you saved the white man on your shoulder. But then I say to people, 
if someone did that for George Floyd, George Floyd would still be here. Hmm. Yeah. But whether, but also we know that there's a system in the media, how that's been marketed around Pat Patrick too. Because mm. it's almost, again, you know, we can't, we can't say certain things, but we can say certain things. Again, this is me code switching right now because no one will show the only time a black person can be celebrated sometimes in our society is when a black person is doing for a white person not for when a black person is doing for a black person. Mm. That's the truth. And also vice versa. The only time sometimes everybody thinks a white person has done really great is how they've gone to save those savages and those really disadvantaged people in Africa or who are black. Well, I think, I think also when you have a, a certain kind of militancy that black people want to align themselves with or subscribe to, it's very threatening for the powers that be um because what what it comes down to is that they they feel as though that sense of rebellion or, or that revolutionary mind will take over um that fear of a black planet if you like you know um that's why they 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 kind of i suppose defragmented or sorry fragmented the the black community as much yep. as they can do now they're trying yeah. to turn muslims they're getting it. They're, they're the terrorists and they're anti, you know, British or, you know, they're, they're not part of the British community. They, they make their own communities in Birmingham or um, in uh, other, uh, anywhere else, I suppose, that they're at in, in big numbers. And so I feel for them, you know, I feel for them right. because be honest to you, I've noticed with the rise of Black Lives Matter, they're realising we can't openly pick on black people now. So who's our next person? So we're going to pick on the Muslims now. If not the Muslims now, we're going to pick on, um, who's the other person? Like now, no one can pick on anyone that's Eastern. Can you remember the period where people were picking on people that were Eastern European because of Brexit? Yeah. Yeah, can you Poland. imagine? Yeah. And I remember me back then, and this was me, one of my um, Lithuanian friends, uh, we've got some nice diverse group. And um, she was like, Marvina, is this what it feels like to be black then? And I started laughing because I felt it takes you going through your own journey of oppression and the fact that people, British people, start attacking you because of your accents and telling you to go back to where you came from, mm. from the EU, for you to now identify with my pain. And as laughable as it was, I had to turn around and look at her in the face and say, yes, welcome to being the new Blacks. Yeah, for a short and time though, because their children, once they get yeah, to their class, right, their their white skin is gonna mean they're just they're British as as the British, you know what I mean? They're lost uh, in the... like so yeah, but bro, that's you deep. Can't hide, you can't hide. Yeah, you're, 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 you're done for no matter what <laughs> speak like. So it's not like we can it's not like we can bleach our skin. Yes, we could. Well, many like... teams, isn't it? Many want to. Um not <laughs> but me, you're but still black. Me. Yeah, of course yeah, you are. The are gonna you're be still black. black. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the funny part of this process that you're doomed if you do and you're doomed if you don't. Mm. You put weave on, someone's going to judge you. You put braids on, someone's going to judge you. You've got dreads on, someone's going to judge you. No matter what you do as a black person, there's going to be someone judging well, think, you for it. What I, what I kind of try to understand is that I'm proud of who I am. Like I said before, the system will try to denigrate me or kind of drag me down or make me seem negative, but I'm the only one. And I think we were talking about self-love before. Yes. How best can you love yourself on a regular, on a daily basis? Um, uh, it's uh, every morning I have to read something that really kind of strengthens me and consolidates my thought process as to what I'm going to do with my day. Um, and I have certain things I need to accomplish throughout my day. And that sends me a sense or gives me a sense of accomplishment. Uh, and betterment and one where I'm growing as an individual um, despite what the system says I you know so you got it's got it's got to be regular but you've got to be disciplined about it as well you know you really got to be it's not easy but it's um, it's not easy we need to start teaching ourselves to take time um, like today apart from teaching online 
I got to a point and I was like, let's start watching Christmas movies, like just randomly. Like I had so many other things to do. I had like some tests to do and everything. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm going to watch Pokemon and it's mm. okay. I'm going to watch some mangas. <laughs> it's all right. I'm going to play some computer games. It's okay. Like I am not going to be useful to anyone if I don't be useful to myself. Um, mm. I'm going to stay in my onesie after this lecture. And and it was funny that we sent a message. I forgot that this today was the last day and we all agreed that we we're going to be at wear our onesie. And then there was a message saying, Miss, have you won your onesie? And I was like, God, you like me because really I wasn't feeling about putting no blazer <laughs> on <laughs> and creating that culture for young people and other people to just feel comfortable to be themselves and um, comfortable with anything that's going on, but also uncomfortable if they want to be uncomfortable because being black is so, you know, we say black is beautiful. You know, I'm proud to be black and it's, it's tiring man it's mm. tiring you just like allow me today just give me a break for today like don't come for me don't don't like tomorrow is the protest in Tottenham by the way yeah, um, for those yeah. uh, for those who are going down um, please please socially distance you know please wear your mask and everything um, and keep safe but even I had to recognize my privilege of the fact that I'm not from Tottenham and I needed to check myself and say, how do I work as an ally to those in Tottenham? As a black person, how do I amplify the voices of those on ground to make sure their voice is heard over my voice? Does that make sense? We sometimes need to check ourselves and see how, who is missing from this conversation. Let's not get the same people. Uncle Martin, if you're available and you're not socially, you should go um, put you on the list to speak. <laughs> Because I think it's needed because as a teacher, it would make a difference if you wanted to. But like... Are you going, Martin? Mm? Are you going tomorrow? Yeah, it's at, it's at Tottenham Police Station, isn't it? It's just down the road from me, 10 minutes away. So. Yay! Oh, Can I book you in? Can I book you in? Can I get your name down? Please, 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 please. Marvina no. wants you to speak. What's I want you to speak because I'm not That's there. That's what she said. She wants you yes, to speak. Yes, I want you to speak. Oh, no. Nah. I want you to speak. I don't Sorry, know what you're I can... a teacher. I don't oh. know what I'm How? D... I would love you to give him a pet talk little... afterwards. It's quarter no, to no. eight. It's quarter to eight. Are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> retrospective. Retrospective. Um, thank you for the space, Hester. And um, George Floyd, let, let, we could round it up. The good things about George Floyd that we loved about this is we got to connect with people who naturally not connect. The movement has gone global. People can become allies in this process. And um, the protest is not all you see on the streets. It's more than that. And there's so much more opportunities for all those out there to get involved. Everybody should be getting involved, irregardless of your race, your gender, your class. Everybody should everybody an attack on one is an attack on all so see this as you're fighting i might not look like you but i'm your brother and sister i i bleed like you i bleed like you like the only difference is that i've got melanin i've got melanin and that's you've got my i've got more melanin than you that's it that's it so um let me go to my Nigerian accent that they beg you in. No, like all gets involved in this kind of thing. It's just easy. It's not that complicated at all. All I'm asking you to be, be a human being. I beg, eh? Just try and be a human being. And that's the simple thing that we're asking everybody to do. If everybody tries to be a, a good human being, a kind human being, we'll be okay, man. Um, and I just realized that Uncle Martin's got dreads. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I've been growing my dreads for about... How old's my daughter now? It's 18. So about 19 years, about about that, that long. About that ah. long. So they, in fact, I have to go to my loctician tomorrow. She's in Wolfram Stove, 10 o'clock in the morning. I have to go to a yard to get my hair wash and twist up tomorrow. So when I come oh. to the practice, I'm looking nice and clean. Nice and clean. Yes, you know, you know, you know. You can't see your hair anymore. We've, got, we've lost you again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to hear you. 19 years of hair growth how has that affected your work 
honestly has it ever been something that people have assumed or treated you at differently work. because of your hair at work yeah what or, if, or when they meet you um well people sometimes ask the question uh you know how long you've been growing it for example or how do you look after it how did you get it that way um are they real all those kind of ideas you know um and oftentimes some some people may find it offensive but i find it just people being inquisitive and i i try and educate them as best as i can that's all i do um so yeah it's 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 a joy i think because i'm proud to be uh black and I'm proud to have my dreads and no one's going to change that. No one. Yay! So it's cool. I like it. I mean. uh, okay. Has that helped, Marvina? Has that helped you the way and your worries about your son's Genesis. dreads? Yeah, yeah. Because um, I don't want, you know, as a parent, you don't want to feel like you're doing something that's going to... We've been taught as black people to really conform so we, we don't want to make things harder for our kids, don't we? We want to make things easier for them with equal opportunities and stuff like that. But then to have Uncle Martin, you know, you know, big man like Uncle Martin, you know, navigating that work field and doing big things. And um, it, it feels like, but this is what representation matters. You see what yes. I mean? Representation matters. And um, those conversations are mm. things that I know that, I've asked him, he just wants the hairstyle. It's not like he has any culture or anything. I just want that. He just, he goes, I like it. He goes, either that or you just black my hair every at home. And I was like, I can't see the platin stuff all the time, but I know I could do the dreads because then that I can keep up every four weeks or so. Um, and um, he- That's such a he, good mom. Uh, we try in it, we try. <laughs> but thank you so much for that um, mm. because that's empowered me. Empowered me to think about letting him just explore it. He might change his mind in a year's time, but not letting fear of what society might think of him stop him from experiencing life, which a lot of us are doing. We, we, we're not experiencing life as black people because we're scared of what people think if we did certain things, which is weird, but not true. Mm. Yeah. Thank you both so much for the evening. Yeah, well, thanks for hosting again, Hester. It's been interesting again, once again. You know, it's been good. Always. Insight. Is there anything you'd like to say, Hester? Just that I'm grateful for you both. And um, um, I think there has been a shift this year. Of, and um, I feel like if there's people watching that hasn't discovered that yet, like don't be af don't be afraid, you know, of making a fool of yourself or, or or saying the wrong thing or like everything, everything's out on the table, and we're all here to learn from each other, and um, that's such a gift. Like that's just that's been amazing, and it was. I mean, it took me a, it took me a while to figure that out. That um, that because of my skin color, I could, I could or could not, you know, like participate in the things that matter to me and uh, and Black Lives Matter to me. And um, at some point, I figured out that I can contribute to the movement somehow. Well, I'm trying to figure it out anyway. So, do you feel you've come? A long way in relation to understanding black issues more or what racism is about did you understand it before or what was the turning point or what I, did you feel was the turning point i went onto the street for the first time for shukri abdi that was the first um, March, but because of earlier, and I think that the kids and the lockdown, like I wasn't able to get out and I was feeling really uncomfortable about it. Mm. And then people were saying like, why are you out? And I was like, it's COVID lockdown, why are you out there? And then I had people say, oh, but it's violent, it's dangerous. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. 
it's children, it's families, it's mothers, it's daughters. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. And then the so reparations some, some rebellion. Were trying to put you off getting involved, were they? Uh, yeah, there was like this mum's WhatsApp group I was in, the, the reparations rebellion. Um, uh, first the Mosiah in the Stop the Manga Music campaign, they call her August Mosiah. And, mm. uh, and after that, a woman said, oh, but uh, I saw some pictures. Uh, they were, it looked very threatening. I saw black people dressed in these vests. It looked very threatening. Mm. Like, yeah, what, as threatening as Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation? Like, they were doing a display. I used to wear that doing street dance. Like, what are you talking about, right. really? I said, you have to be very careful. Mm. You have to be very careful how you're reacting and what, and what you're looking at and what the, what the media is doing. And uh, I ended up just going on loads of rants to other white people like getting angry and and um and making them sort of say things that were probably quite uncomfortable like are you afraid of a skin color like what is this about and 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 some older ladies they were like yeah that's how we were raised and I said well it's not good enough like you have to you have to question it and figure it out and call it out yeah I, I do you think that not enough people like yourself are deconstructing what they're seeing. They're very much just accepting it as almost verbatim, the truth, absolute truth, is it? And, and that's the mass, most massive danger, you think? I don't know. I mean, our family's mixed. Um, you know, my auntie's Kenyan, uh, my cousins are Indonesian, um, my granny is brown skinned. Um, we're, we're kind of quite a global family I don't know I, I grew up in inner city London mm. and uh, I think like you, you were you saying or, or, or uh, Kevin saying that, that our our subconscious bias is kind of created on the five people we spend most time with or I think Kevin, time Kevin, Kevin mentioned that didn't he yeah he did say that yeah yeah so um You've got, you've got to get out of your bubbles. You've got to break out of them. And um, yeah. I, I, I'm afraid of going outside London. Yeah, me too. Because, because the country's racist. Wow. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, I don't want to go outside London. Or I'd go to I towns. Live- I'd go to visit towns if my friends like lived there or, you know, Bradford and Birmingham and there's some great places. You live in... Birmingham or Leeds? Leeds. Le- Leeds. Yeah, like Leeds. Leeds. Like I like Leeds as well, yeah. but but um small towns can't get along with people. I'm afraid of that. <laughs> um, okay, I understand now. I understand now. I'm not gonna there's lie. A, there's a lot of white racists in small towns where there's no uh, <laughs> mixing and no migrant communities and I, I think I think the funny thing is that what people don't think about around um, small town is is ignorance Um, and the racism is a little bit over um, than covert like what you guys get in London. So I think in London and places like that, people have learned how to be narcissistic about their racism. Do you understand? So it's hidden. So you, you might feel safe, but it's a false sense of safety. It's a very yeah. false sense of safety. So I would say that at least here, we know what our problem is and we know how to tackle it straight away because people are direct about it. While with yours, there's a lot of lip service. There's a lot of looking a side kind of way. And there's a lot of one black person in, another black person out kind of policies going on. No, we, we don't want to give too many black people that opportunity, but at the same time, we give enough to keep them sh- quiet. We don't have enough funding, but we'll, we'll pick the ones that we're going to give it so we divide the community. And all that's been happening in London a lot. Or I'm, like place. I'm learning about that at the moment, like turning black people against each other. And that, that, was, that came up in a conversation in a meeting this morning where um, in, in, in this movement that I'm in, there's like, no, we, we deal with marginalised people or we're the, we represent the black people. We don't need any more black representation. Like just weird weird clashes really weird I'm trying to navigate it all 
So it's the master's tool, isn't it? It's the <sighs> master's tool. It's the master's tool, and we just need to call it what it is. And what's the shame is that people are not recognizing and seeing it. I need you that, to come and speak to them, Marvina. Oh, uh, I, I, I think I know the You've got enough to do. About, You've got enough to do. You've I think I know the situation you're talking about. I, I think I do. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a peacemaker. I would like for us as all black people to get along because if we don't, we don't need to get along. We don't even need to like each other. I don't need you to like me. I don't need you to agree with me. <sighs> when people get to that point to realize that it's not about me, it's not about how, it's about the struggle, the struggle, if you care, I don't care about names being, look at the fact that the first thing I said, I know that I'm checking myself and saying, you know what, instead of me speaking, can I get brother Martin to speak? Do you understand what I mean? It takes, sometimes it's not only the same voices that need to speak on an issue, because if the same people keep talking, the change doesn't happen, because no one knows what the potential of what brother Martin will say, but I know I'm hearing him, and I know that Whatever it says, it's going to be something different from what they've heard me say. It's going to be different from what any other person who normally occupies that space says. So this is the thing. We need to start thinking, how do we diversify and decolonize our conversation? How do we, it's not about being, asking why people to be allies, but how are we allies to each other? How do we challenge and create opportunities for other voices to dominate the, the space? So. I think this is where it comes to, we're also working in our closed doors and with ourselves to make sure black lives matter to black people. I don't know about other people, I know I'm doing that. Um, and that's an important thing to do. And the only reason we have to do that is because the white man has made us not think that we were important to each other. So it's almost like trying to get back to that thing where we no longer fight within each other because we can see the tactics of the master's tool. Because all you need to do is throw some money. It's like, you know, they say, throw some ass on that cash, that, that, that ass, like some cash on that ass or something like that. You know, like I'm going into my little like twerk. I, I don't, we don't twerk as black people. Let me say that. We whine and grind. Twerking, you guys created that all by yourself. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I know I, I, I come across as an old froggy, even though I'm still like, I feel like I'm a baby. You're a mentor and a role model. And your majestic Marvina. Hey, big up to get us like, I swear, I don't even know why I'm talking like that. I naturally don't talk like that at all. You know what I mean? Cold switch. I mean, I'm going to have to go. It's eight o'clock. It's I been do. such no a problem. pleasure. Really and just blessings for both of you on your, on the rest of your year. And, uh, and thank you so much. And likewise, have a good evening, Hester. Enjoy, enjoy. I am going to... You too, Marvina. I love you. love you. I'm calling you now, Uncle Martin, yeah? Don't pretend well, you don't you, know my number. She's going to get you, you to know. speak. She's going to get you to speak at the protest. Oh, she's going to get you... No, please, please, don't, don't leave me hanging, you know? <laughs> yes, a real well, I, might, I might have a few words. Might have a few thinking words. thinking about it. Yay! Christmas <laughs> came early. Hey, hey, hey.